100 Police Department, the Kansas City, Kansas Community College Police Department. Uh, and there's a lot of agencies that we work with, of course, FBI, CIA, DEA, and so many others, but all of us work together to try to make sure that we handle crime in our communities. That's one, two, is making sure that uh, the people that we are um, locking up and putting in prison, that they are in fact the right individuals. Uh, we've created the Conviction Integrity Unit, and so that unit continues to uh, really make sure that the folks that we believe committed the crime are the ones that should be incarcerated. My line is that the only person that really benefits from a wrongful conviction is uh, the person who committed the crime. <laughs> and so uh, we try to make sure that we cover uh, public safety on the front end uh, when it happens and on the back end to confirm and make sure that we have the right folks. And then the last uh, layer of what I do is making sure that the victims of crime in our community uh, have the support and resources that they need to deal with, as Chandra so eloquently put it, the trauma uh, that they experience. And, and right now, uh, the, the trauma that our country and our county uh, has experienced for having to witness uh, uh, such crimes. And so uh, in, in making sure that folks are able to move forward in their lives, despite the, the uh, trauma that they have experienced in the system. So that's me uh, in a nutshell. Uh, on top of that, I'm a father of four beautiful, happy babies. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pastor Rick, you want to go ahead and take it next? Sure. Um, I'm Rick Behrens. I'm pastor at Grandview Park Presbyterian Church, which, if you're tired of hearing me say this, some of you, it's not in Grandview or in a park. It's here in Kansas City, Kansas, in the Central Avenue neighborhood, uh, just off of Central, one block south of Central, one block east of 18th Street. Um, I am pastor here at Grandview Park. I'm also the co-chair of the Moore Squared Board. That's Metro Organization for Racial and Economic Equity. I'm a founding board member of AIR, Advocates for Immigrant Rights and Reconciliation. I'm also on the Mainstream Coalition Board and the Downtown KCK Rotary Board. Uh, my impetus for involvement in action uh, and advocacy really starts from my faith perspective. There are the priestly and the prophetic roles in our faith tradition. And though I've never really been comfortable in the prophetic role, I do believe that faith leaders are called to do both. My advocacy and action really started in earnest uh, back in 2006, when I invited some pastors and priests to meet <coughs> our church, to talk about creating a local pro-immigrant voice uh, in the faith community. We started a group called People of Faith for Hospitality and Justice. That particular year in 2006, talk radio was spewing anti-immigrant uh, propaganda. The Minutemen, who are those guys who sit in in lounge chairs on the border with their AK-47s and a beer in their hand. They had started an organization in Olathe here in town. Uh, the Sensenbrenner bill was out there, which basically is Trump light. Uh, back then it, uh, it was pretty scary though. And, and there were people in our neighborhood living in fear. And all this rhetoric was causing them not to even want to go to the grocery store, they were afraid. All these anti-immigrant movement movements were thriving. And the faith community, at least locally, wasn't saying, pardon my French, a damn thing. And uh, so People of Faith or Hospitality and its successor, AIR, began to be a voice in opposition to anti-immigrant hysteria and policies. So for me, it was a natural outgrowth of what I had learned from the Bible, what I had learned from leaders like Dorothy Day, Martin Luther King Jr., and Cesar Chavez. In addition, it was in response to relationships that uh, I had become deeply involved in in our neighborhood and community. Awesome, thank you. Um, I want everyone to know that um, as we go through this, there's a few of us that are on here um, and we still have more people coming. Um, if you have questions, I will be watching the chat. Um, so feel free to make comments, questions. We are recording this, so um, it will be on our website at some point as well. Um, the whole series and the whole workshop will be there. So um, feel free to use that feature so that we can have great conversation. Okay, Miss Andrea, Global Neighborhoods, you're up. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Andrea Genero, and I'm with Livable Neighborhoods, and we're a unique partnership between 
registered neighborhood groups and the city um, of the unified government. And uh, we provide support to those neighborhood groups and resources and are often liaison between neighborhoods and the city. Um, and I got into this work. Um, I'm from Wyandotte County. I grew up, uh, it's my, I'm like third generation on my mom's side. And um, I've always cared about the community and always wanted to work in Wyandotte County as I got older. Um, what, what, doing what, I had no idea. Um, but I was led to this position, I believe, in some ways, and I get to see the hope in our community every day. I get to see people who are passionate and care about their neighborhoods um, volunteer their time to um, help clean up their neighborhoods, help keep their neighborhoods safe, and help look out for their neighbors. And so I'm grateful every day that I get to see that. Awesome. Um, so for those of you who are just joining us, we are, um, we just introduced our panel members for today. Again, feel free to use the chat feature if you have questions. Um, we are going to get started with Andrea. She's going to kind of just give us an overview over the unified government, what that looks like, why it's different, and, um, um, and just hit a couple of key points for that. And then we're going to move on again. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them. This is the time. This is the place. Um, uh, if we, I don't want us to leave here confused for any reason, any reason. And if anything, I want us to be motivated to get into our government system and feel out, figure out what's going on and, um, and find out why we need to make sure that everybody's voting. All right. So Andrea, it's yours. And let me know when you want me to pull up what you want me to pull up. Okay. If you just want to put up the info sheet, um, we'll just start there. Okay. Um, and we can share this info sheet with everybody. Um, I just sort of picked out the details. So I know some of you who are more familiar with the process will probably say, wait a minute, there's this and there's that. I was just trying to make it as concise as possible and easy to understand as possible. And we can delve in a little more if you want to. I also want to put out there from doing this presentation and other venues, I, I am not advocating or against any way that our form of government is set up. I'm just providing you the information. <laughs> that is what we do at Livable Neighborhood. So I'm just providing you the information as to um, what our government looks like and um, we can discuss how you feel about it, but that's primarily what I'm doing now is just showing you what that is. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'd be more than happy to talk about it later, talk with you later more in detail about your personal feelings about the city government. So um, just real quickly, a lot, of the, a lot of times I get a question about what is the unified government? What does unified mean? Um, and basically in 1997, our residents voted and agreed to unify our city and county. And that just meant that we, meant, we went from having a seven member city council uh, and three member county commissioner board they were replaced by 11 person board um, made up of eight commissioners um, that represent a different district in our community as well as two at-large commissioners um, and then also uh, there's the mayor who also sits on that now the mayor's role um, he does have the ability to veto uh, but he is more of a tiebreaker in the voting between uh, amongst the commissioners. Um, within Wyandotte County, there are three cities, Bonner, Edwardsville, and Kansas City, Kansas. And I clarify this because a lot of people will say, well, what about Turner, Kansas? And there is not a Turner, Kansas um, in the area. That is Kansas City, Kansas. Piper is Kansas City, Kansas. The only, uh, the only three cities are Bonner, Edwardsville, and Kansas City, Kansas. So um, now they do, there are different school districts um, within those areas, but the, the actual city is just made up of the three. Um, so you have eight commissioners that represent eight different districts. Bonner and Edwardsville has a representative. And then we have seven others throughout the city. Um, and like I said, then you have the two at large. The two at large are Commissioner Bynum and um, Commissioner uh, Burroughs. Um, are the two at-large commissioners. I was not going to name them all because I didn't want to forget anybody's name while I was sitting here. Um, <laughs> I do know all of them, but, um, uh, but I, I, and we, we can share that information. I can share that information if you want me to. Um, so that's kind of the, the, 
what the unification is. And the idea was that if we unify the city and county, it becomes less confusing for residents. Meaning before you might go over to the county side and go visit county offices that told you to do one thing and then you'd come over to the city side and the city side told you to do something else and sometimes they didn't agree. And um, so the idea with this would just unify that effort and make it a lot easier for residents. So uh, that's the form of government we have. Um, the form of, or the form of what our city is, what unification is. The form of government we have is a city manager form of government. Um, and this is just the style of government we have. It means that we um, have a commission that deals with the and mayor that deal with the policy issues within our city. And they hire a uh, county administrator to oversee to date the day-to-day -day, um, operations of uh, the city and staff. Again, the idea with that is that you have that separation. So the county administrator is dealing with the day-to-day -day city operation and staffing issues, and the elected officials are dealing with the policy piece. And the idea that those are separate. Um, so a couple of important things uh, with that to remember um, is that all the, again, the policy is done by the commission. The day-to-day -day operations and the internal way that business is done is through the administrator's office, the county uh, administrator, which is Doug Bach. Um, and then I also have a organizational chart that we can real quickly look at if you would like to do that. Um, that just kind of, and anyone can find this on the website. If you go to wicokck.org and you look in the search and you put organizational chart, uh, the organizational chart will pop up and it'll just sort of let you know um, the city piece. So, so the organizational chart is for the city. These are all employees who work for the unified government. They're not elected officials. Um, they're not appointed. They're all hired positions. Basically, you have the a county administrator that's hired by the commission and mayor. Um, then under him, you have assistant county administrators. And then there are some departments that report to him directly. So um, the police department, as well as um, economic development, are two that, um, there we go. Um, so public relations, the commission liaison, so that's the person that's hired to sort of assist the commissioners and working with the administration, um, kind of a just a liaison between there. Um, the finance department, um, the fire department, the police department, the legal department all report directly to um, the administrator as well as economic development. And then the administrator has three assistant administrators um, and they oversee various departments within the city. So as you can see, anyone that says ACA is an assistant county administrator and they're over lots of different divisions. And so those divisions and departments um, report to those assistant county administrators and then those assistant county administrators report to the county administrator. So this is just sort of a breakdown of what that looks like. Um, and you will get all of this. I have, if you're registered for this, um, I have your emails and we will send out all of that um, in your email. Andrea, we have a question. Who does Doc, Doug Bach report to? Doug Bach is appointed by the commissioners and mayor. Okay. So they, they're the ones who, um, if there's a position open for a county administrator, they will put out the nationwide search. It's like any other job that um, anyone would, like a superintendent or something like that. They put the word out across many channels, they receive the applications, they review those applications, and then they hire the administrator. Okay. Okay, were there any other questions specifically on that? So we have another question. Do they hold him accountable for decisions made? Yes, I mean, if, if they receive, um, now keep in mind, the administrator's job is over staff. So staff procedure, um, the administrator is not, does not make decisions about ordinances or um, laws or policy that's voted on. Um, now his staff will gather the information and um, present that information to the commission, but the commission and the mayor um, 
well, the commission primarily is the voting structure that would push policy or laws or ordinances through. Um, it's not staff that, or the anybody under the administrator that would necessarily vote policy or laws through. Um, another question, uh, yeah. but doesn't the mayor make the ultimate decision? No. That is the big misconception. So a lot of people keep their eye on the mayor. The mayor can only veto and act as the tiebreaker. The only other authority that the mayor has is to convene. So we'll get into a little more a power, a couple more powers that he has as far as convening um, that we have listed below. But that's it is not ultimately up to the mayor. Um, uh, it's the commissioners that will vote on those um, policies and procedures. The only time the mayor is involved is to veto or to break a tie. Bet a lot of y'all didn't know that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so if you pull the one sheet back up, we can go a little more through how a policy moves through, okay. which I think is kind of where our questions are leading a little bit. Um, but uh, so on that, we okay. talked a little bit about the, the structure of government, just so you know. If you want more information on our structure of government, the National uh, League of Municipalities has really great information on the different forms of government. Um, and ours is one, I think there's six, uh, or no, um, there's mo mo many other cities across the country who have that form of government that we have, and you can just learn more about that and who those cities are, so. Have a couple more questions, Andrea. They're just okay. coming down in, which is great. So the question is, how is Doug Bach evaluated? Um, each, every year, he goes through a yearly evaluation um, with commission, the commission. And um, just like any staff within the unified government, uh, everyone has an evaluation every year. They're supervisors, uh, and those are all submitted to human resources. And so Doug Bach has a, a similar review with the commission every year. Um, if there's something that they think he should be working on that he's not, or something he's addressing that he's not, um, that will be addressed there. And then they will create an action plan to uh, make changes or um, move forward with whatever needs to happen next. So, Pastor Rick, can you kind of uh, specify on this? Are you asking, does the mayor have the sole power to hire the administrator? Is that what the question is? Okay, so that's the question, Andrea. Is, does the mayor have the sole power to hire the administrator? No, um, my understanding is that it's, it's decided by the commission and the mayor. Okay. So I can jump in, I can delve into that a little further if people would like me to and find out for sure what the process is exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that it's, that it has to be voted on by the commission as a whole. Um, the mayor might lead the search and be a part of presenting that person, but I believe that they have to be um, voted through, uh, through the full commission. Okay. So if the county administrator is literally running our county in a deficit, which one can see if you go to the web and look, how can he or the commissioners be challenged to check his viability as that person in that position? Okay, um, anyone can share their concerns with their commission. They can share any concern that they have about the account administrator with the commission. Um, and it would be ultimately up for them to make any decisions based on the work that he's doing. So, um, that would be that would be where my recommendation is if you have a concern with what the administrator's office is doing that those concerns need to be taken to the mayor and commission. Okay. Um, um, the mayor does have quite a bit of authority to set the agenda, right? Are we talking about the agenda for the meetings or what, Mark, which one, what are you talking about with that? Yes. So if we go a little further on my sheet here, we can, we'll delve into that a little more. Okay. Um, so how policy gets made and discussed and officially approved. Um, and this is how it works within our city. So um, different UG departments will bring issues to the commission regarding policy. Again, we need to focus back on policy, ordinance, laws is what the commission is looking at. Um, 
not the, if you don't like how a person in a particular department handled a situation, that's a staff issue. And that needs to be held with their supervisor and with the administrator's office. What we're talking specifically about is policy um, and laws governing our community. So, um, so, but staff will bring issues of policy change that may need to happen and different things to the commission for approval. Um, the mayor will then assign one of the, uh, one, the issue to one of the four standing committees, um, which are subcommittees of the governing body, the commission, um, that will hear from both staff and the community regarding each issue. So there are four standing committees. They include uh, administration and human services, public works and safety, economic development and finance, and neighborhood and community development. So the standing committee is where these issues get discussed. Um, it's where they're debated, it's where they're talked about, it's where community input, um, it, community input is, is, you can have community input on, on other areas, but this is where it's more powerful to hear the community input and it, it gets involved in the discussion process. So this is what people need to understand is that by the time it's made it to, and this kind of says this at the end of this document, but by the time the decision has gone to the full commission, it's already been de debated. It's our, the information's already been presented by staff on the particular issue um, and community members have kind of had their input. So by the time it makes it to the full commission, it's already been debated and talked about. So where people really need to put their energy is into these standing committee meetings. Um, when they want to stand up and, and say something in the standing committee meetings. The standing committee meetings are open to the public. I will talk about how you can get on the agenda. I just saw that pop up in the chat. So um, the standing committees are open to the public. The agendas are online. Um, and I'll explain a little bit of how you get on to those agendas and how, how you can um, speak if you would like to. So um, those are the four standing committees. Uh, and the issue must receive a majority of the vote on that standing committee before it moves to the full commission. Now, many things happen within that standing committee. One of the commissioners can ask to pull the issue. Um, if, the, if there seems to be a lot of community, that's usually what happens. If there seems to be a lot of community upset around a particular issue, a lot of times the commissioners will ask that that issue be pulled so that staff and the commission can delve in a little more to see what, what exactly is the, um, you know, what's going on and what are people's concerns. Uh, but that's where those kind of things will get discussed and it won't move to the full commission unless there's a majority of the vote in the standing committee. So then once that standing committee votes to push it forward, then it'll get put to the full commission for a vote. Okay, so if you want to speak on an issue, if there's something that you do have a concern about and you wanna speak on an issue, all those requests are made through the clerk of the county's office. Um, that can be done online through the um, website. You can mail it um, and you can also call. So I would call or email or mail either way. There's lots of different options. If you check on the website, there's a lot of different options for you to do that. Um, the commission meetings currently are being done via Zoom as well as the standing committee meetings. Um, so they're not having, I don't, believe they're having in-person meetings right now. I'm not sure about the public um, access to those. So as far as offline and in-person. Um, but what I would also like to put in here too is, and those meetings are usually on Mondays. <laughs> they, start, they start at 5.30. Um, and uh, again, the agendas are online. Um, livable neighborhoods, when we get the agendas, we try to share them so that people have those a week in advance and they know um, when those meetings are gonna be. Um, but you can also, again, find that information on the websites. The meeting and the agendas are both listed there. Um, and you can get, you can find out when those are. Um, it'll, you'll also find out, I tell people, look, because sometimes if there isn't anything on the agenda, the meeting might be canceled. So off, I'll, I often tell people to keep looking and, and make sure that that's not the case. So, um, so that's kind of how you would get on to the agenda to speak. Um, what they what will try to happen too is again if it's just a general complaint about day-to-day -day operations the administrator will try to 
um, see if they can get staff to help address the issue if it's not necessarily a policy issue. Um, if, if it is a policy issue, then this is where the mayor, the mayor has some more authority to convene. So the mayor actually sets the agendas for the standing committees and the board of commission meetings, which basically means he's the one who puts these agendas together. And so when something is either not on the agenda um, or taken off the agenda, it happens through his office. Um, so that would be if you notice that there was something that requested to be on the agenda and it was not put on the agenda, then the mayor's office is, and the clerk's office would be who would follow up to find out why not, why that wasn't placed on the agenda. Now, understanding that the clerk does not have the authority to put it on the agenda. The clerk can take the concern and pass it along to the mayor's office, but the mayor is ultimately responsible for the agenda um, and sets those agenda for those meetings. So. Um, and again, the last bit is it's important to note that by the time it reaches the full commission, the debate has already happened. Um, the information has already been shared. The commission have, has had it for a bit at that point, and a recommendation has already been made um, by that vote of the standing committee to move it forward. So that's why it's so important for people to understand when those um, standing committee meetings are. Um, and there are also sometimes special sessions. Those special sessions are usually informational, and that's also an important time just to hear um, what staff is presenting, hear commissioners' concerns, and to see where commissioners lie um, on a particular issue. Uh, that then can help you decide whether or not you, you know, feel like you need to advocate to a particular commissioner on a particular issue either way. Um, so those are good things to watch. They're all available on, um, on YouTube. And if uh, you're like me and you have a seven-year-old who sometimes will not go to sleep, they're also really great to get your kids to sleep. Oh, wow. And them next to you to watch, <laughs> to watch those meetings. So get the family involved in civic <laughs> engagement. Um, <laughs> but, but they're all available online. They're all recorded. Um, they're also when we are not in the middle of COVID, they're they're generally the they're open to the public, and you can be there. Again, I don't know. Um, I'd have to double check on the specific in-person meetings. I still believe they're not having in-person meetings uh, with the public yet, but um, in the phase three. But um, but yes, so those are all available, and you can watch them on. Oh, sorry, you can also watch them on the UG's cable channel. Um, they will put them there uh, as, and um, if there's a special session or something that's kind of a larger topic, they, they will sometimes even do like a Facebook Live, so. Awesome, Andrew, can you speak to the standing committee? We have a few questions about that. Um, mm -hmm. It's them, who are they? Where did they come from? The standing, standing. committee? Mm -hmm. So the commissioners sit on the standing committee. Um, I, I do, off the top of my head, I, sorry, I do not have who is on which committee currently. Um, I have not looked since Commissioner Ramirez was elected and, and um, sworn in, so I, I'm not sure how those moved around. Um, but again, you can find that committee information on the website. I can share that with you also, Chandra, so that um, they can see who's on those committees. Mm -hmm. um, but that's who makes up the committees, is those commissioners. Okay, awesome. The elected commissioners. Okay. So it sounds like um, we need to pay a lot of attention to our commissioners. Like yes. they hold um, a lot of the decision making, a lot of things going on with them. So um, just a little side note when we start talking about who we put where and when we start talking about voting, right? Yes, and I'm, I would I always recommend that if you have an issue um, with, you know, a, a policy issue that you think needs to be addressed, I encourage people to reach out to their commissioner. I mean, there's no, there's nothing that stops you from calling your commissioner, from sending an email to your commissioner, um, to write, you know, writing a letter to your commissioner. I mean, there's various ways that you can reach out to them. And oftentimes, um, again, when we're not in COVID, uh, you know, um, restrictions, many of the commissioners are at community events um, and you'll you can see them and we normally have a monthly livable neighborhoods meeting where at least three of them attend 
and anyone can walk up to them and talk to them about a particular issue that they have. So um, I, I would say I've been doing this for about 15 years now and I have never, I rarely has it been a situation where a commissioner um, can't be approached um, and isn't willing to speak to a resident on a particular issue um, or at least look into it. So, um, and I know from working within the city that commissioners take com uh, resident re uh, issues and concerns very seriously because I, as I'm sure uh, the DA has um, witnessed, you will get an email from the commissioner's office <laughs> wanting to know about a particular issue um, or a particular, you know, complaint that they received. So um, I know that they take those seriously and, and they look into those. So um, I recommend people talk to their commissioner, try to develop a relationship with your commissioner um, on various issues. You don't just have to reach out once. Um, make sure they know who you are and what you you want for your, your your area of the city if for some reason you don't have a good relationship with your personal commissioner um which unfortunately has happened in some areas you also have commissioner at large commissioners two at large commissioners um that can also speak to your concerns um so don't just think that if you know I'm in district so-and-so and I really don't get along with my commissioner. There's other people that you can reach out to that can bring those issues to the table. Um, we have a question. Can a commissioner override the mayor's decision to not include an item on their agenda? <sighs> um, <laughs> for you today. <laughs> so, um, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry. I've never seen that happen like openly like formally so i can't really address that but i i can find out i promise i can find out what the formal process would be i do know that if and some of you who do watch the meetings um and have watched the meetings for years know that when a commissioner asks for something to be on the agenda and it does not make it to the agenda they will make that very public that they asked for it to be on the agenda and it was not placed on the agenda. And uh, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes it will find its way there to the agenda um, just between that public saying of, look, I asked for this to be on the agenda and it didn't. So a lot of that is resolved that way um, more openly and sort of like, I requested this to be on the agenda. It was not on the agenda. Can you please explain why it wasn't or, um, you know, give us a reason as to why, um, and that usually takes care of it there um, in the, for the most part, but not always. Uh, but I, I can find out what the formal process is if a commission, if a commissioner asked for something on the agenda and was not able to get on the agenda, I can find out for sure what that formal process would be. Okay, Andrea, I have two more um, questions and then we're gonna move for time's sake on to the next topic. But you all feel free to keep asking um, your questions, put your comments in. These things will be addressed, um, whether we address it at the next meeting or if we have a little bit of time at the end of this, then we'll get around back to it. One and I can share my email too as well. If you and if anybody that. wants to talk more or wants to just shoot me a bunch of questions, I'm more than happy to find the answers and get back to you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So one of the comments is my commissioner told me after I asked how I could help, said she'd only she's only doing what is related to her job description and not obligated to address community concerns. Where are the job descriptions located? Um, that will be on the website, www.wycokck.org. There's a whole page on commission. It shows you who they are. It shows you what districts. Um, I don't know the specific instance that you're referring to or what you were talking about specifically. But again, it's important to keep in mind that commissioners deal with policy. Um, they deal with policy and laws and the legal and the, the ordinances, not, you know, like, I mean, they, they do, but the administrator's office deals with staff and internal issues. So if you don't like the way that the street, the street cleaner machine came and cleaned your street, you can tell your commissioner about that, but honestly, the commissioner is just going to turn that into the administrator's office and then they're going to deal with it staffing wise. So um, 
you can bring those complaints to your commissioners. I would never tell anyone that they can't bring any complaint to a commissioner. But just understand that there are some things that are probably more administrator office meant for the administrator's office and not for um, commission necessarily. So um, again, I don't know the specifics of the question that you, the complaint that you made or, or what the concern was, um, but their main concern is around policy and laws and ordinances. Okay. Um, and the last question that we're going to ask on this section before we move on, should groups that work in WICO but their employees may or may not reside in WICO reach out to the at-large commissioners or all the commissioners? So anyone who lives or works here is free to reach out to commissioner. Anybody is free to reach out to commissioner. You don't even have to live here. Um, but Yes, definitely. I mean, people who work here, people who play here, people who live here, people who have family here, um, I would say definitely be as engaged as you can be in our community. Um, that's one thing I love about our community is we, we love people within our community, sometimes to a deficit and that we're very like, like internal and like people from KCK, but we also love people who love our community. So I Very would say anybody who cares not. about our community, reach out uh, to a commissioner if you have a concern, so. Right, Steven, you're absolutely right. Sometimes the, um, he said the website can be a little tricky sometimes. So what we may need to do is kind of um, on a different, like our next workshop, just kind of go through the website just to kind of show um, ease of usability for people um and kind of point out some of those things so yeah i will say the search engine has gotten better for those of you who may have used it in the past um <laughs> it has gotten better so i literally right before this to print it off went to the website in the search typed in organizational chart and it brought me right to the commission page so um so i know that that has gotten better but i i walk people through the website on a regular basis so again I'll share my information. If you ever have a problem reaching any piece of it, let me know and I can direct you. Um, a really good way uh, to miss having to search for some things is if you scroll to the very bottom of the website, there is a link directly to the commission. And one of the first things on there is agenda and minutes. Um, there's also the YouTube logo, as well as a little television and either of those can get you to past meetings or videos that you want to watch or if you're wanting to watch live it can also get you there so that saves people a lot of time and trouble too is if you just scroll all the way to the bottom um, the commission link is right there as well as those um, icons we had a suggestion um, andrea um, and i kind of talked a little bit earlier um, about her creating a brochure oh yes and um, so we have a suggestion that a guide to the website would be great. So could we include that in the brochure that we're? Yeah, um, yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working on trying to put together like a pamphlet that would give them, um, kind of give the information that I shared today, but maybe a little more in detail. Um, and we can put direct links to where those can be found um, on the website so it can be shared electronically and we'll also print some also that, so that people can pass them out. Um, with that information on them. But yes, I, I agree that um, there is a lot of assistance that uh, people need with the website. The hard thing is, is there's so many things on there. There's, I mean, as you saw from the organizational chart, all the departments, all the divisions, each of them has a piece of the website. And within their section of the website, there's like a gazillion links and definitions and links to, um, uh, reports and um, documents to fill out and things like that. So um, it, it can be hard to put together like a, an overview of the whole website, but definitely those key parts and where to find things. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And Great I'll remain on. because I love the panel and I want to hear what everybody has to say. And um, I'll be here if there's more questions after. Awesome. Thank you.
Um, so we have like two more components of this that I want to throw into um, our conversation today. We're going to get the aspect from um, advocacy and what that looks like, some advocacy experiences on policy change. But before we go to that, I want to do the legal part of it uh, first. And that's why we have DA Dupree on with us today. So um, just kind of how do we work to change policy um, and what's the le legalities that go with that? And um, are there policies in your office that like what, to, what degree do you help set policy or what's your role in that? Overview of process in the different policies and statutes that we abide by and how that works. Uh, I will tell you, number one, I'm very intimidated uh, following behind Andrea, and so if I am not as good as she was, I do not have any shared documents, <laughs> so you just get my voice. You can give them to me later. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, having said that, so uh, as the district attorney, so what that is is the chief law enforcement official all right, uh, not officer, but the chief law enforcement official, elected official in the, uh, the county. Uh, as I stated earlier, my role is concerning public safety. And we have to go by the Kansas state statutes. Uh, and so when it comes to crime, uh, we have to follow what the Kansas statutes indicate is a crime. Now we have a city uh, um, prosecutor as well. So I want to break down the difference between my office and the city prosecutor. And when I say city, we're talking uh, about both Kansas City, Kansas city prosecutor, then you have Edwardsville city prosecutor, then you have Bonner Springs uh, city prosecutor, and then you have the state uh, and county district attorney. So my job is over all of those cities, and we deal with all of those felony and misdemeanor crimes that come through the state statute and is a violation of those uh, statutes in the crime uh, or in those statutes. Whereas the city prosecutors, they deal with, as Andrea uh, so eloquently described, those ordinances that the commissioners uh, or in council, and depending on what city you're in, um, create. And so you have those traffic tickets, you have the uh, trespassing and you have misdemeanor batteries and assaults and things of that sort that the city commissioners uh, have created or the county commissioners have created. And with that, the policing agencies that can write those tickets uh, are subject to those cities. So for instance, uh, a Bonner Springs police officer, uh, they they're the only ones who can write a ticket for the Bonner Springs ordinance violations. Kansas City, Kansas, KCKPD are the only ones who can write those tickets for city ordinance violations. The only difference is here in Wyandotte County, we have the Wyandotte County Sheriff's Department as well, and they, they carry two uh, booklets around, right? And so they carry uh, the booklets that allow them to write some tickets, specifically traffic and otherwise for the city, but then likewise, they have that dual role as the sheriff is a county uh, elected seat to be able to write state tickets as well and, and violations. And so, um, but all of those agencies are able to write those same tickets for the state violations directly to my office. And so when there is a felony crime that happens or a misdemeanor state crime that happens, in Bonner Springs uh, and Edwardsville, at KU, wherever it is, those same officers and agencies, they then would write a ticket or a uh, affidavit and submit all of those uh, probable calls uh, statements to our office. Uh, they couldn't submit it to the city prosecutor because the city doesn't have the state jurisdiction. They couldn't submit it to the county because the county doesn't have that jurisdiction. It comes to the district attorney's office, which is a state agency. 
uh, if I can connect it to what Andrea was talking about, even with the, the map that she showed up, showed there. The reason why the district attorney's office is not on there, if it is on there, it's to the degree of our budget, uh, is because we're not a part of the unified government. It is a part of the state of Kansas. And by statute, the state of Kansas says that the local uh, county government must fund the budget for the district attorney's office. And so though all of the other, if you will, departments and offices fall under Doug Bach and or the mayor and the commissioners, the district attorney's office falls under the state. And so it, it they're the only, uh, umbrella of the unified government that we have is when it comes to uh, requesting the budget because they're statutorily mandated to uh, fund the DA's office. Uh, once the case comes to the district attorney's office, that's where we are able to dissect and look at, at all of the cases. What we've done uh, is begin to really look at look at what the policies and the law has done to positively affect public safety in the community and what it has done to negatively uh, affect. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the laws that used to be in place was the um, cocaine versus uh, crack. And so in the 80s and 90s, uh, there was statutes and laws that were passed that says that if you are uh, caught with cocaine, which is the powder form of crack, and it is more expensive, then you were going to get uh, probation or uh, a smack on the hand. Versus if you were caught with crack, which was the heart and rock of the same substance, then you're more likely to get 10 years to life. Uh, and around the same time, then came the law of three strikes and you're out rule, right? Many of us uh, remember that. And what we found was both of those laws and policies uh, were statute and they were uh, the law, but it was disproportionately affecting people of color, specifically African-American by the droves. Uh, and in fact, that's when our prison system in our country went from around 250 uh, folks to 100,000 to a, about 700 folks to every 100,000. And so there was a, a huge desperate impact by those laws. And so what many folks begin to do is lobby and talking to our uh, legislators, uh, both in D.C. and locally, to change those laws to really get rid of the policies and laws that that deliver desperate impacts on uh, certain uh, groups of people. And so, what we've done is uh, in this office is is really start focusing on uh, not just um, following through on the laws that uh, folks violate, but doing an analysis on the front end and working with our state officials and help drafting laws that would be more preventative as well as making sure that we're not consistently, which has been one of the biggest issues, uh, sending people to prison versus uh, what I've coined as smart prosecution, which is looking at the underlying issues and ordering uh, potentially uh, drug rehabilitation, uh, mental health uh, uh, treatment, and, and so on and so forth. And so those policies and those statutes are governed by our state officials. So who we have as our state senator, our uh, uh, representative, so on and so forth, is extremely uh, important. Uh, if I was to compare it to what Andrea say, said, it would be uh, those folks in Topeka are as powerful as our commissioners are uh, on the state level. And so when we have laws that disproportionately affect one person or another or one group or another, or laws that doesn't make any sense, uh, those are the folks that we need to really uh, contact, have conversations with, uh, reach out to, uh, many of them of which I've, 
I, I now host a legislative uh, luncheon where I bring in all of those legislative folks and sit down and show them how the statutes that are on the book uh, negatively or positively affect the people in our community and what's in the best interest uh, of our community. Uh, one of the uh, uh, m one of the most heinous examples uh, that we had to deal with was concerning uh, the protection of our children uh, and whether or not uh, the state was doing enough to make sure that our children were protected uh, and that the that our office, the police department and DCF needed to go and do more uh, then wait until a child was, was killed and murdered by his, his parents and our office had to deal with it. And so when that happened, we didn't just deal with the case. We then followed up with legislation that we believe would best protect these children that would make more individuals mandatory reporters and give it, making it easier for people to uh, uh, come and, and report child abuse and so on and so forth uh, so that the crimes that we see are crimes that actually uh, really make the community safer, but at the same time, we can prevent victims from becoming victims. And so in a nutshell, that's kind of an overview of everything. This office handles uh, a, a lot of things. Uh, we also handle making sure that the uh, victims who, who come and assist us in uh, being those witnesses and turning over the evidence that they are, again, get the resources uh, that they need. We also deal with uh, those uh, immigrants who uh, are coming and asking that, hey, I can help you with this crime, but listen, I want to make sure that I'm not going to, to get deported because somebody is upset and mad. And so we work a lot with that area uh, it was a huge step with the Supreme Court saying that DACA is still viable. My office, along with 80 other prosecutors uh, in the country, again, taking that prevention aspect, uh, wrote an amicus brief to the United States uh, Supreme Court to talk about how important it is and how it uh, really brings about trust with the community, uh, with those who uh, uh, feel like they don't have a voice. And quite frankly, as a DA, if we don't get community buy-in, uh, when we have crimes happen in this community or before crimes happen, then we can't prosecute cases and we can't prevent people from being harmed. So we need everyone's uh, trust. And so uh, we really work on the front end concerning the policies and concerning the statutes. And then when we see that a statute is not good or is not really doing what I believe the intent should be, then we draft legislation and send it on up the road and try to convince them to change. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what we have. And so, Chandra, I'm I'm not as good as Andrea. So, if you want to ask me questions, I'm not even going to try to read stuff uh, from <laughs> chats. <laughs> I'll ask you. We do have a we. Have, <laughs> you're doing great. You're doing great. We have a, a comment that says, "Thank you for being understanding and empathetic in your prosecutions." Um, and then we have a question of, "Does your office have influence over who is held in pretrial?" De detention or is that more of the sheriff in courts um, concerned is that we hold more people pretrial because they can't make bail when public safety is not at risk impact of even a short time in jail on life potential is not possible oh, so a couple things one thank you for uh, uh saying thank you i appreciate that you know you don't you don't get a lot of thank yous in this position so <laughs> You know, that's just like people wait for life, and they usually don't say thank you. Uh, so, uh, but concerning your question, the answer is uh, it, it ultimately comes to the judge. Uh, so, when a person is arrested and they are detained uh, based off of the crime, uh, then my office makes a recommendation of what we believe that an appropriate uh, bail or bond should be. I'll tell you that my office has been a major uh, pusher of, of bail reform. Uh, I think that we have way too many people incarcerated pre-trial, and a lot of them are in there because, not because they're a danger to the community. Now, here's what the statute says. Statute says uh, everyone has a right to uh, for viable bond, uh, but you have to be uh, incarcerated or rather held pre-trial for two reasons. One, if you are a harm to the community. So if you are a risk that you're going to get out and, and harm the citizens, 
or two, that the judge uh, believes that you will not appear back in court. Those are the only two re uh, reasons that you're supposed to be held in bond. Traditionally and historically, uh, what has occurred, and it was really around the same time as that crack cocaine uh, slash three strikes rule uh, epidemic, was this whole tough on crime, uh, uh, the rule of law. When you hear that that term, the rule of law, it, it's, it's not really focusing on the people. It is a scare tactic in what they have utilize is in the best interest of the community, uh, we're going to keep them locked up. Yes, they're innocent until proven guilty. However, uh, they scare us. So we're going to give them a $100,000 bond. And what you find is uh, that the person who has a $500,000 estate and mom and dad has a lot of money versus the guy whose mom and dad got $500 in the bank and they still got to pay their mortgage or their, their rent. Uh, one of them gets out of jail before trial and the other one stays in there for six months to a year awaiting trial. And then the cycle repeats because what happens is the longer you sit in jail, the more interested that plea becomes. So if you tell me after six months in jail, look, man, take this plea and I'll let you out of jail on probation. I've been in jail for six months. I've lost my house. I've lost my job. My wife says she's going to leave me. I haven't seen my kids. Anything I can do to get out, right? And so then that cycle continues to, to go. So who has the final say on that? It's the judges. We make a recommendation and then the judge makes the ultimate say. Uh, but here in Wyandotte County, judges are elected. So I'm gonna speak candid uh, and I'm not gonna give a disclaimer, right? Because I'm an elected official. So if you don't like me, just, you know, vote. Uh, and so, but here's, here's the disclaimer, the, or not the disclaimer, but the reality. The reality is elected officials traditionally has been, have been afraid of, of, of going down this road. Again, it all falls under that smart prosecution, that holistic prosecution, looking at the underlying issues. And so what many do is say, well, I don't want anyone to think that I'm soft on crime. And so therefore I'm going to go hard on crime and I'm gonna give a high bond for that person who most people stereotypically believe is a criminal. Uh, and so oftentimes they stay in custody for uh, a long period of time. And thus the, the desperate impact is the, the broke folks stay in where the folks who got money get out. And it disproportionately affects black and brown folks the most, especially in our county. And so uh, the judge has that final say. Now I'll tell you that with that bail reform push, uh, we have been pushing it and pushing it. And, and in fact, even at charging, we attempted to go from uh, fouling charges and then uh, arresting them immediately to we wanted to submit uh, summonses, right? So you receive a ticket and say you need to show up to court if it's a low level crime, so on and so forth. Uh, we got a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. No, they need to be arrested. Uh, and when COVID came, well, now we've been able to really change that. We've released about a hundred plus individuals out of the county jail. Uh, many of the folks have now received uh, those summonses as well as a, a signature bond or something of that sort to really not put individuals in custody uh, because of this COVID and because it could be harmful not only to themselves but also to uh, the other inmates and the deputies. And so long answer, but bail reform is a, a, a big, a big conversation. It is something that, that we've been working on for years, but right now uh, the spotlight is there and, and people now feel like they have a political cover, right? Uh, to, to be fair and impartial. <laughs> so. um, how can we review a judge's job performance? Uh, well, you know, uh, all of our judges are elected in and every four years, uh, you get to vote. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's how you review it. Uh, I know some jurisdictions have um, actual uh, judge review forms that the attorneys of that bar can fill out. And then that can be made public on how good of a job they done or didn't do. Uh, I don't believe that that happens here in Wyandotte County. Uh, and so if it does, I haven't mm -hmm. seen it. Uh, 
uh, I think the, the remedy is uh, kind of following judges' cases and see what, the, what it is. Here's, here's the other part. Most of what happens in our courthouse concerning criminal justice, uh, the public doesn't know about it. Uh, and that was one of my biggest things when I came into office and why I hired a public information officer. Uh, because I believe that the, in order to hold public officials accountable, you need to know what they do. And for centuries or decades, rather, in, in Wyandotte County, uh, as was stated earlier, we're close-knitted people. And if you're a dot, baby, you love it. And, and you have a certain way of doing things. And one of those uh, carryovers that, that are not really good is the secretiveness, right? Because uh, when it's done in quiet, it appears that it's then done under the cloak of darkness, which then brings about the whole home cooking, good old boys, my cousin taking care of your cousin, and you know, and then everybody's intermarried now, and so you don't know who's on the bench and who's, <laughs> player, who's cousin and auntie. That's why you gotta talk nice to everybody when you come to the courthouse. Everybody's related. I mean, except for me and my brother. <laughs> Except for that, obvious. Um, so, and and we did have Pastor Trina made a, a comment that I totally agree with. Poor legal representation does play a factor because people can't afford um, the legal representation that they need and pay bill or either. So, well, and and, and on that note, one of the things that uh, uh, one and, and I'm looking now. I'm looking at that that last comment. Right? How do we? become more informed about our public defenders. Uh, we don't have public uh, a public defender's office in Wyandotte County. Uh, again, this is something that I've, I've met with judges, I've met with uh, uh, different attorneys, and so this is how it's set up. In Wyandotte County, when a person is arrested for a crime, they have the right to go before the court, they then are able to tell the court whether or not they can afford an attorney. And if they cannot afford an attorney, then the law says that you must be afforded one. You, that means the state has to pay for you uh, 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 an attorney. Uh, and sometimes that is done weeks after you've been sitting in custody before you get that opportunity to say, I can't afford a lawyer. And so once that happens, uh, one of the attorneys who may have, had, may have their own private practice they're then appointed as the attorney for your case, right? Uh, and what we've found is that there is uh, about a two week to 30 day delay from the time an appointed counsel is appointed to the time that that inmate uh, sees that attorney, right? And so oftentimes there's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks uh, continuances because those appointed attorneys uh, uh, didn't go see that inmate. And so then it makes the case go longer and the county is paying a, a nearly $100 a day for that person to be in custody. One of the things that I've said is, look, we are one of the biggest counties in the state and we definitely have the highest, I think second to Wichita, um, volume of cases that we deal with. Uh, why don't we have a public defender's office? I worked in a public defender's office in Johnson County and that public defender's office it's like the opposite of a prosecutor's office. You have 10 to 20 attorneys and their sole job is to be appointed by the court. And they immediately go see those defendants. They immediately deal with the cases. And then here's the other thing. It takes away that, uh, remember I was saying that cloak of darkness, that, that politic feel, uh, it takes that away. What do you mean? Well, if I'm the judge and I have to appoint a murder case, which is big money, right? Uh, if I have to determine who I'm going to appoint that to, uh, I get to choose which one of these attorneys I want to give it to. And uh, depending on who I know is going to determine on who I give it to. Well, if I'm that attorney, uh, if I want to make sure that I get appointed to that big money case on the next round, then I want to do whatever I need to do to continue to make that judge happy so that I can get appointed. That is the appearance. I'm not saying that's what happens. I'm just saying that that's the appearance. And so to get rid of that, what we have to do is have a public defender's office who's not subject to uh, the wrath or the benefits of befriending those who can appoint them. 
Uh, whereas a public defender's office, once they're appointed, their sole job and responsibility, it's not connected to their to the monies and the purses of a judge's signature, it's connected to that defendant and doing what's in their best interest, filing whatever motions, going out to the constitutional rights, and quite frankly, you know, coming at the prosecutor the way that they're supposed to be, and maybe defendants won't be sitting in custody for two to six weeks waiting for an attorney to come and see them. That's what we need in Wyandotte County, and that's what I've talked to my legislatures about. So we're going to ask two more questions. I have two more questions for you, and um, and then we're going to move because I want to make sure that we get to this um, to the advocacy piece of, and what we play and what some of our agencies are doing when it comes to politic, uh, policies and things of that sort. Um, one of the questions was, and this one is... Um, this is where we talk about real talk. And again, for anybody who has conversations with me or anything, I, I support real conversation, right? So um, the question was, and I'm gonna frame it in such a in, a, in a way for this conversation. We all know that there's an issue. If we don't know, we're getting ready to find out or we may need to just observe some things in the government a little bit between the DA's office, the mayor's office, police office, different things like that. Um, how does the community support um, the DA's office in, in what, they, what they're trying to do or any of the offices in what they're trying to do? How do we get our voice heard as, um, basically, how do we heal this dysfunction that's happening? What, what, what's our role in that? Well, I, I think our role is uh, uh, really, one, paying attention. Paying attention, uh, knowing what's happening and what's going on. And then two, speak it up. I mean, every elected official, uh, the, the people is the judge, the jury, and, and the executioner. Uh, but if the people don't know what's happening, then the people can't hold us uh, accountable. And so uh, just in, in a nutshell, since I've been in office, we've created the Conviction Integrity Unit. And that Conviction Integrity Unit is the first in the state, and it looks at past cases possible wrongdoings, of possible uh, uh, constitutional due process violations. When I created that, oh, it made a lot of people mad. It ticked folks off because it scared people into thinking that Dupree is saying that if you've been in the system for however long, you're saying that they did wrong. And that's not the case. My focus has always been on not people's feelings. Now, maybe I should be a little bit more sensitive, but when you have people such as Lamont McIntyre, who spent 23 years in prison for a crime he did not commit, my focus is on the freedom of victims of our system and not the feelings of the people who made all the money in the system. Uh, and that has gotten uh, me a lot of pushback. That's gotten me a lot of, 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 of uh, not good publicity. Uh, again, if you're from the dot, you love the dot. One of the things we know we love is, uh, or, or, or that we hate, is change. Uh, we don't don't mess with stuff. Don't uh -uh, keep it the <laughs> same. We do it the way we do it. Uh, but the problem is, uh, I I grew up here and I seen the mistrust of our community uh, with with not just law enforcement, but with all of downtown, city hall, criminal justice system, all together. And so my focus has really been coming from as a dot and not being connected, not having the advantages. My daddy wasn't a politician. My daddy wasn't a judge. He was a preacher and he, he all he knew was to pray and say, son, just make it home at night. So having that thought process and being in this position, it says, look, I'm not worried about the politics. I don't care. You can hate me. Before I ran, you didn't know me. I'm focusing on the people and making us work together. And right now, and I'll tell you, I've met with every chief of police uh, in our county. I've met with the mayor. I continue to meet with the commissioners because the very things that I've been saying for these last three years are now something that everybody is starting to talk about. And what I want to make sure that we're all careful on is uh, the same people who are talking now, uh, they've hold, held them positions for years. And so just because they're talking, doesn't mean that it goes from conversation to conduct. It's the people's job to make those calls, to make sure that you're showing up to the, the meetings, and then holding us elected officials accountable to move from conversation to actual conduct and change. 
So I do want to give this um, for um, organizational purposes. <laughs> Alive and Thrive does not, um, Alive and Thrive, the organization, does not uh, condone or create a platform for any political person. What we do is try to give you the information um, that goes with those positions so that you can make informed decisions. And I'm saying that because we are, we've are we talked about the commissioners, we've talked about mayors, um, we've talked about uh, DA. Please be mindful of what these positions do. Um, who they affect and things of that sort. So this is what we're providing this platform for. And when we think about the disconnect that's happening in our government, our unified government, not being so unified as we thought, um, we have to make sure that we're putting people in place that promote that, right? Um, one more question uh, for you, DA, and then we're gonna move on. Um, uh, I think I heard you say that the county is mandated to fund the local DA what specifically is funded and what is not funded? So all of my employees and staff are funded out of uh, the unified government. So all of my assistant district attorneys, all of my staff, all of my investigators, victims advocate, uh, as well as uh, my funding, it all comes out of uh, the budget process. Uh, and uh, oftentimes what, what is important to note is when what the statute says is that whatever the district attorney believes is necessary to fulfill his duty as the DA, the county is mandated to uh, fund. Uh, and so at times uh, with the Conviction Integrity Unit, I, I, I had to show how that Conviction Integrity Unit was important in fulfilling justice as the DA. And so right now we're in the process of expanding that conviction integrity unit into a community integrity unit so that officer involved complaints of any sort from all of the agencies in Wyandotte County can have an independent investigation by a certified law enforcement officer in this office rather than someone who is within the agency. As I stated earlier, my brother, of course, is a judge, and the, the chief judge says that because of the appearance of impropriety, I can't present a case. In fact, nobody in my office is able to present cases in front of him because it appears that it, he would do something or I would do something that is inappropriate. And that is the same thought process that we have concerning community complaints as we are where we are right now in our country, in our county, and in this world, uh, to build that trust we need to have those safeguards so that the people in the community can feel and see that trust. Here's the last thing. That's not funded right now. That is the push to get that funded. That's where, as Andrea put it, those standing committees and going before the commissioners. That's what we're in the process of doing right now. And the people need to let their voice be heard on whether or not that is important. And I'll tell you, it's extremely needed as many people refuse to file their complaints concerning law enforcement because they don't feel comfortable going to that same agency. And so at the end of the day, the folks who are in these positions, whether it's my position, judges, uh, any elected official, here's what you gotta remember, regardless who you vote for, racist vote, bigots vote, Traditionalists and good old boys, they vote because they want things to stay the same. And so if you want things to move forward from that good old boy traditional way, though I love the dot and the dot way, if you want us to evolve, you have to make sure that you're voting, you're conscious and not voting at all. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is awesome. Um, we got a lot of a lot of information to chew on. So, I mean, if y'all are like me, your wheels are turning about this is a conversation we can have. This is something else that we can do to promote this. Um, that was really good. A lot of information that we've had. But um, again, what is information if you're not going to use it? If you're not going to act on it, um, then it's a waste of time to me anyway. So uh, we're going to get into the advocacy piece of this. Um, and we are going to 
start talking about what that looks like with a couple of the agencies in the community um, and just kind of what some of the challenges are that we may come up with. So I'm gonna start with you, Val. That's okay. And um, can you just kind of give us some, a picture of what it's been like for you advocating for policy um, and what this journey has been for you? And do you all, what do you all do as far as like voter registration, education uh, and outreach and things of that stuff? And where do you get your information about candidates? I know I just asked you a whole bunch of stuff, but you have these questions previously. <laughs> oh yeah, you're good, you're good, no worries. Um, so for me, at Centro, um, if, I, if I'm going to specifics as to something that I worked on um, and currently uh, still working on would be safe and welcoming. That's been a policy that we've been trying to get the unified government, you know, to kind of uh, move forward with. Um, and really what our work here at Incentro has been about when it comes to that is amplifying the voices of the community. Because we know that that's something that the community wants. Um, if you guys don't know what Safe and Welcoming is, I can give you a really quick, quick breakdown of it. Uh, it's an ordinance that we're trying to get passed. It has two parts. One part is uh, we need a municipal ID for individuals that don't have a municipal ID. This means it's not a driver's license. It's not going to allow you to vote. It's just an ID. You know, we have a big homeless population and a lot of these people, you know, they can't go and get the resources that they need because they don't have a photo ID. So that's one thing we're fighting for. I um, mean, the other thing that we're fighting for is we want um, uh, our police officers to not work with ICE. We want the funds for our local police to stay in our local police. Uh, you know, we don't want them doing the jobs of immigration. Those are two things that here in Wanda, uh we know the community wants and needs. So what we do with the kind of work I've done here with that is I try to find, I, I find the individuals in the community that have been vocal about why they want these things to happen. Because my job as a community mobilizer is to amplify those voices. So what I do is um, I do a lot of story banking. So I talk to a lot of members of the community and I have, and I share their stories. Um, you know, that's something that can kind of help. Um, it's more sentimental. It can open people's eyes as to why we need these policies, uh, why we need these changes when they hear a very personalized story. Um, so that's one thing that I do a lot for that. We do a lot of phone banking, a lot of just talking to members of our community here in Wyandotte, um, explaining to them what uh, these policies are and how they would help them. Um, and then what was uh, your other question? It was, uh, Voter education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, information. Yes, el el centro is not partisan. So you know we we can't tell people how to vote, and we don't. But what we do is we just need to get people registered to vote. You know, uh, Wyandotte has some of the lowest voter turnout. Um, so so we need to get our people out there. Um, I focus heavily. My focus is on the Latino population. Uh, but I know the African-American population needs to get out here and vote, too. Uh, both of us, you know, what we what we focus on is we kind of have to start at a very, very base level here at El Centro. Because my community, uh, what we want to create is an educated voter base, right? So it's not just about, you know, get out to vote, get out to vote, because that's not going to cut it. We, we need to kind of explain to them um, the system. No, and Andrea did a really, a really good job at explaining all the moving parts. And imagine if all, all that information is in a language that you don't know. How are you supposed to get involved when you don't know that language? So that's a huge part of what we do here at El Centro is we make sure that all of our documents are in Spanish. You know, I sent some, um, some handouts over to Chandra, which just shows you like the basic, the, the level that we start at when we, when we talk about educating our, our voter base. Do you want me to show it or? Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, it's, it's in Spanish, so some of you guys might not be able to read it, but it's, it's really, it's broken down into simple terminology. So when we're talking about um, a ballot, what is a ballot? You know, what does it mean when people say, hey, do you know what's on your ballot? What does that mean? What is a 
Congress, what are what are what is the Congress? You know, senators, representatives. We have to start defining all of these things for our community, um, and that's the base that we start here at El Centro. We, you know, talking about. Uh, I, I, I put it also on there, you know, trans language, trans languaging, which is the importance of our community to see documents in their language. You know, we need to see people, uh, we need to, they need to see those things in Spanish because like, like I said, if we're only speaking to English speakers, that leaves out a huge population now, especially here in Wyandotte. Um, so that's that's some of the things that we do um, as far as how to educate our base. Um, we also we're putting together a class where we're kind of we're explaining all the the local politics, all those uh, base levels. So what is a commissioner? You know, we have to kind of explain to our community what are the differences between uh, elected positions and appointed positions. All that information needs to be told to them in Spanish. Because um, like, like I said, we can't just ask them to get registered and go out to vote. Uh, that's not enough. So we kind of start at, uh, the, at the base level, which is just terminology, a lot of definitions, um, a lot of explaining, a lot of just teaching them um, what the system is. Uh, and when it comes to resources that I use, um, I put it on here as well. I use a lot of the Rock the Vote. I use KS Votes. Um, Utopia is a good one as well. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that the website for like the unified government is a bit complex, um, which I 100% agree with. When I try to go on there and I try to find information about, you know, uh, who's, what are the candidates, who's on the ballot for whichever district, uh, it can be very overwhelming. So I don't use that one as much, but I found that uh, Vote 411 is super informative. Um, the website is very nice, very user-friendly, a lot of good information on there. With All you gotta do is put in your, your address and it'll pull up your ballot, it'll pull up who's gonna be on it. Uh, it'll pull, pull up like voter registration deadlines, all these uh, deadlines that we that you need to make sure you you know if you want like a mail-in ballot, all that sort of stuff. So those are the resources that I use. Um, but one of I think the most important resources that I that I have as well is just my network, network of people that I've that I work with, that I've met, um, network of people that I know that work within the same community that fight for some of the same things. Uh, those are really good people to kind of bounce ideas off of as well and create, uh, kind of create handouts and create, you know, what does our community need? Uh, talking to those people that also work in community organizing, that's also a really good tool as well. Awesome. We have a couple of uh, questions and um, one has been answered in the questions. Um, does the UG have a international support office? Do you know about that or Andrea, can you say that? Um, not necessarily um, an international support office, but every single department within the unified government has access to interpreter lines. And so language should never be a barrier for any department. Um, every single one of them has access to a um, company called Propio that they can call into and they have hundreds of languages available there. And then most uh, materials are translated into Spanish um, and a couple of other languages. Okay. Um, Pastor Trina, thank you. Pastor Trina, I know you had the concern about the Burmese, Nepali, African residents in our community. And I do know that on Proprio that those languages are on there as well um, so that they can so they can get help with that. But um, you also, Andrea also put on here, Bethel Community Center or Catholic Charities is good with assisting from that. And so did Bernetta. Thank you guys for that. Um, any other questions? Okay, 
Pastor Rick, you all will get um, these, uh, the handouts that Val had so that you can kind of use those for references as well. If you're registered, I will get that to you um, in your emails either today or tomorrow. So um, we are going to get some information from Pastor Rick now. Can you tell us about what you do? All right, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> in, re in relation to this. Val um, and I did not coordinate our conversation, but when, when you ask in the, in the preliminary ma material you gave us about an example of policy, um, I headed the same direction Val headed because we both are working on the safe and welcoming policy uh, along with El Centro, AIR, Moore Squared, Grandview Park. Uh, we have a coalition of thir more than 30 organizations that are working together to try to get safe and welcoming passed. And as Val said, we've done, it's been four years now we've been working on this. So that gives you a little indication about how difficult it can be to get a policy passed. Uh, it's been four years since we first started working on this policy. And we've tried lots of methods and strategies, uh, including neighborhood canvassing, phone canvassing, thousands of signed postcards to the commissioners. We've done listening sessions for education, both with the commissioners and with the community, community meetings and forums. Um, that on top of having conversations with all these different organizations to try to get support, and we've gotten support from the community. Many of the organizations that support safe and welcoming are on this call today. Um, so we've done a lot of work and it's taken four years. And, and finally, after four years, we did manage to get a special session of the commissioners to have a meeting about a month ago at the end of May to hear and discuss the policy, not to take any action, but just to hear about it from their staff and then to have a discussion and allow for public input. That was about a month ago, and we had 150 people who signed on to that Zoom meeting, that special session meeting. Many of those people were ready to speak at the end of the meeting, and none of them, uh, only three people got to speak at the end of the meeting because the agenda was manipulated in such a way that it didn't allow any time at the end, any significant time for speaking. And of the three people who were interviewed, who got to speak for their three minutes, none of them were immigrants. Mm. Um, also, the presentations at that meeting um, didn't offer any of the reasons why it would be a good policy, but only offered negative uh, interpretations that came directly from the sheriff and the police chief with no other uh, positive ideas about the policy. Um, the good thing, perhaps, is that we do now, as a result of that meeting, have three commissioners who are willing to champion the policy and who are working together with our coalition to find a way to bring the policy effectively to the commission for a positive vote. So that is a good thing, I think, that came out of the uh, special session. And it's, I think, an example of the way in which commissioners should be working with the community. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, it's not another way for it to get sidetracked and not really happen, um, that we put some time frame to it so that it, it doesn't stretch out for another four years uh, to try to make it happen. Um, a little bit of response in, uh, as far as more squared and air and Grandview Park uh, about what we do about voter engagement. We have a, well, we're not able to do it now, but we have a door knocking uh, method that we call deep democracy. Um, so we knock on doors when we can, not during COVID. Um, but prior to COVID, we were knocking on lots of doors and having conversations with people about what's important to them in their community, what kinds of things are difficult for them to face. And it's amazing what these conversations turn out to be. Um, even even when <laughs> I've been knocking, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I I can barely get by. But even when I'm knocking on the door of someone who is a primary Spanish speaker, and we begin to ask and talk about the issues that they're facing, they are more than willing to open up and share. 
So in those deep democracy discussions, we also talk about the importance of voting. Uh, and, and much of that now has shifted to a phone banking system that we can do during COVID. And we're doing the same sort of deep democracy conversations with people uh, through phone banking. Um, you ask what, in the preliminary questions, you ask what I've learned in all this. Can you tell us like some of the challenges and then we can go into what you've learned? Well, maybe my, maybe my what I've learned elaborates on the challenges. <laughs> I'll try that. Let me, let me then, give you a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what I've learned is what most of us already know, uh, and that in a governing system that's so stacked and knitted together by white supremacy and white privilege, any attempts at policy that push for systemic change to how people of color are treated by the system is going to be met with fierce, fierce, fierce opposition. And that goes from the mayor the county administrator, through the commission, through the UG employees that inhabit that white tower down there, through the power structure and the rank and file of the police and sheriff's department. We are a community dominated by an entrenched white political machine that is not interested in relinqu relinquishing one ounce of its power over black, brown, and broke people. All you have to do is look at what's happening with the DA commission, uh, the DA, um, the DA race that's happening right now to see how strong people are fighting to hold on to this white privilege and white power. All of this white power and supremacy, it's crazy in a community that has far more people of color than white people. What I've learned is, first of all, that we have to keep fighting and keep raising our voice and keep talking and keep shouting. I'm reminded of that story from the Bible of the widow and the unjust judge. She just keeps coming back and hammering that unjust judge until she gets what she deserves, justice. I, what I've learned is that these realities that we want to change and the policies that can create a beloved community are not going to come to reality to be apart from a dramatic change in who shows up at the ballot box. And several of us have already talked about that. We've already talked about that. We've got to get people to the ballot box to make these changes that we want for our community. Uh, it's too stacked against the values that we want to see, uh, see happen in our community. That's great. Awesome information. Um, you said a lot, <laughs> a lot in that. And it is so also true. Also true. It really comes down to everyone um, working together in our, in, and that's using our community voice. You mentioned that you had a lot of um, a, a lot of you all's activities. How do people find out what you're doing to stay engaged? So when you're doing the workshops, when you're doing the, the door knocking, things of that make the calls. If people want to volunteer for that, how do they, how, how are they able to do that? Well, um, we have we monthly meetings. Uh, More Squared and AIR both have monthly meetings that engage the community. Um, so actually next Monday is a volunteer meeting for AIR uh, that's going to be on Zoom. Uh, so it's easy to tap into. I think it's at six o'clock next, next Monday, but uh, um, if you go to AIR's Facebook page, you can find that event and you can sign up for it. More Squared has an Issues to Action Night that's the third Monday of every month um, that now, that's on Zoom for now until we can gather again in person. Um, and More Squared has four task force. Uh, one is on criminal justice, one is on immigrant uh, issues, one is on housing, and one is on voter engagement. So More Squared... Uh, at their monthly issues night, breaks into teams and then talks about and big, puts plans together for how to address those those four issues right now. I will also share that um, Alive and Thrive, we are discussing um, putting together a community uh, civic engagement calendar um, in which that um, if, they, if there are events going on or trainings or rallies, marches, whatever, um, then 
people can have one place to go to find out that information and what's happening with that just for easy navigation of what to do. Um, and so we're working on that on our end and hopefully we'll have that um, going pretty soon. So if you have anything that you would like added on that, please send me an email. Um, we do have a question um, and this is, uh, I'm gonna make this general for, cause we have a lot of organizers on the call, on this call. Um, is there an organized effort in WICO among those not part of power to support to support those of color to run and to help them do so? Um, before anyone answers, I will say that in our last community Zoom meeting, I believe it was our last one, um, with the Lab and Thrive, we talked about uh, possibly putting together uh, workshops to help groom people to be in political positions um, or just kind of help them um, know what they need to do if they want to be in political positions. Again, we're not pushing anyone. We're just providing the information. So um, yeah, if anyone on, the, on, on this call would like to address that or if you know of anything. I don't know of any uh, organization that is, uh, you know, showing people how to do it. So I think that would be great. I would absolutely play a part any way that I can. Uh, I, I, I will tell you that uh, I have pushed other organizations, specifically the NAACP and others, to really kind of take this charge and, and do something. But there's there's been a, a lack of that push. And, and, and quite frankly, a, a, a lot of fear, right? A lot of fear because you don't want to uh, uh, groom people to take uh, someone's position that you're depending on them on appointing you to this council or this task force or this whatever. And so you have to be careful. And so I think it would be good for that to happen. Uh, the second thing I would say is as we continue to push uh, uh, but people of color uh, and like-minded folks uh, to, to run for office, uh, as the first African-American district attorney elected in the state of Kansas, I want to say uh, it was wonderful making history but it was hell making history. And I've been catching hell ever since I made history. And so when we're, when we're doing this, right, you need to do it because it's a calling, uh, whether you're, you believe that God called you or whomever your faith is. Uh, and you need to have that, that real fervor and really focusing in on, on people and making change for people and not the politics. Uh, and then word of encouragement on the back end of those who are not in elected positions, uh, it behooves us to, to not only encourage, but to support. Because when, you, when you're in these positions, you're in the limelight. And when you feel like nobody else is on your side, you feel <laughs> like nobody else is on your side. <laughs> yeah. was, you know, I, I used to make fun of people who said uh, Biggie and Tupac Shakur were philosophers. But I'm gonna tell you, they I understand me against the world, baby. Like, I get it now. I, it was philosophical, right? And so we had to, I'm sorry to go from quoting Jesus to, to Tupac, but you get the point. They were very prophetic in their own way. <laughs> and so I think we have to have that, that global understanding of we want to encourage people to run, uh, but then we as a community have to make sure that we don't just build up a structure to get them to run, but we, we build up a structure to support them uh, and to help push uh, the the purposes and the reasons for them running through, because just running in it and getting there, it doesn't stop there. Now I got to fight the masses who oppose, and so that's where the people have to really have a structure to come in and push. And so I give kudos to to uh, Pastor Rick and and Morris Squared and to the many other folks who are on here who who are not afraid of speaking truth to power. And, and that includes me. I've, I've gotten calls and, you know, invited folks into my office thinking it was going to be a friendly conversation and was like, no, you're wrong. Like, okay, all right. But that means we have to have that structure so that we can have that community support. So uh, whatever I can do to be a part of that and to help, count me in. Great. And can I Chandra, also I'm, add, I'm add oh. something about, I'm sorry, can I, <laughs> just quickly, uh, more squared, uh, part of what we do is, I, I mean, a, the a biggest portion of what we do is training people to be politically active. And, and our 
our end game on that is that those people who become politically active, speaking up about the issues that are important to them, our end game is that those people then take it to the next step and end up running for those offices so they can be in the position to make the changes that need to be made. So um, we, are, we are part of a training process that the end game should be that people who become active then take that step uh, and, and, and move forward in it, so. Ajaya? I know, I was just gonna say um, that I think it's important for people to know that you can have a voice in the process and not necessarily be in. Kind of froze up on us there. Andrea, do we have you? <laughs> okay, we're gonna give her a second to unfreeze. <laughs> Come back to that. Uh, so, and this is just a little break. I just got a text message <laughs> about um, about my name. So I'm going to give you all the, the correct pronunciation of my name. It's Chandra with a hard C-H. So <laughs> just for future purposes, I was just told to share that with you all. But um, Andrea is still frozen. Okay, so while we're waiting on her, uh, Ms. Dola had a great um, comment. Um, how do we know what the actions are so that we aren't working on the same issues. We all find out that there, um, we, we got a wheel over here working on something, a wheel over here working on something, and then they're working on the same thing. Do we have any suggestions on how we can narrow that down? I love that question, because if you know me, I don't want to have to have 10,000 meetings on the same topic. So um, how can we create a way that we're not duplicating what each other is doing? Any suggestions? from our panel or anyone else? I think um, one of, I mean, just being up front and kind of having a, a place where it could be here or, or somewhere where we're open and, uh, and we kind of just tell everyone what are we working on, you know, just so that we know because like El Centro and More Square, we work together on stuff and we're currently working together on some stuff. Um, so maybe it would help if we um, have like a list of everything that More Square is doing, everything that El Centro is doing, everything that AIR does um, and is doing as well. Just, I, that's one quick way that I could think, I could think of. Another thing, and now plug Alive and Thrive on Wednesdays, if, for, and if you haven't had the opportunity to attend, we come in um, on Wednesdays and we kind of talk about what's going on in the community, what different agencies are doing. That would be a great time to kind of find out um, some of the different discussions that are happening. We have a few minutes and I do want to be um, mindful of everybody's time. I do want to say thank you all for taking time out of your day to have this very important discussion. I want you to know we are just scratching the surface. This is just getting started. Um, and we do plan on moving project master spreadsheet that can be shared and updated. I like that idea. I like that idea. Um, so we are uh, planning on having a couple of more of these. What I am interested in are other things that you all would like to hear about when we talk about the educational piece. I will share that again, the whole ideal of this is to move to where we start really addressing policies um, and, uh, and different things that are not trauma-informed in the community um, and how we can support each other, excuse me, in those efforts. Um, what, what, what community groups do we need in place um, when we talk about um, a group that supports uh, elected officials of color or, or different groups, who do we need in place looking up policies and reporting out to people? What does that conversation look like for us? Um, we heard some things that were very heartening today, discouraging, but then we also heard the way that we are able to come up against these things. So we, it's time to put it all together and, and start having those like conversations and making them productive, right? Um, so, Please feel free as we're getting ready for the next one. Um, when we do have the next one, which will be soon because we won't lose momentum on this, 
um, send me whatever your um, ideals for different topics or whatever questions you have that you would like to see addressed. What more information do you need before we start getting into the planning stages of, uh, of providing those different um, support systems in our community? Because we're gonna, if we, Mark was, well, he was right. If we don't, as the community, speak up and say something and make change, it's not gonna happen. Wandai County will stay the exact same way it is. And I'm very big on if you don't vote, if you basically, if you don't put in on the meal that we're going to eat, I really don't want to hear what your situation for food is. If <laughs> you're not going to put in on it. So, um, any last comments? <laughs> past the red. Any last comments before we uh, get out here? We have uh, from our panel, we have about five minutes. I was going to say Andrea's back on, so I wanted to hear her comment. <laughs> oh, she is back on. I didn't even see you come back on. What were you saying, Andrea? I'm sorry. I My computer was telling me it was running low, and I ignored it. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> no, I was just going to say how important it is to realize that anyone can lead in their community. You don't have to be an elected official to lead and make change. There's a lot that you can do from any level that you feel comfortable. We still need to encourage people to run. We still need to encourage people and support them when they get there. Um, it's just like in the presidential elections, you shouldn't just be voting for the president. You should also be voting in those people who make the decisions on who's making the laws and policies. Um, so I wanted to say that because I think that's an important piece. And it's also important to build relationships with people who can, who, who are in positions where they can change view and they can change uh, policies or they can change internal ways of working um, for the better of the community. And so I, I would encourage people to just talk to lots of people about um, how you feel about change in our community and what you wanna see done and build those relationships. Um, I look and I see a ton of familiar faces on this call from people that I've built relationships with over the years who have resources that they can share and help. And so um, just make sure to do that um, when you're moving forward to build your base of people who can support you in the work that you want to do. Good, good advice. Like it's Val, you have anything for us before we go? Any last words? Um. I guess one part that we didn't talk about a lot that I was hoping we would get to, um, just because of the work that Alive and Thrive does, I just want to plug in, you know, the importance of, at least my community, we have generational trauma. That I think before we can get to all these other things, you know, to get them to the polls, to get them to go be involved, we got to heal a little bit. Um, and I think the work that Alive and Thrives does is, is exactly what our community needs. I think we need more of it. I think we need more resources in mental health, uh, mental health and we need more resources on um, understanding how trauma trickles down into our whole society. You know, uh, when it comes to uh, substance abuse, uh, addiction, crime, it's all, it's all connected to that trauma that our community uh, goes through and has suffered from. So I think that's a very important part that we, we really need to tackle as a community um, to kind of keep us moving forward. I will tell you before we actually get to picking policies uh, and before we get more specific about policies, we will do um, a trauma training on here so that we understand more why we are picking the policies that we are picking or why these policies are more um, how they affect our community and how they contribute to the generational trauma and what that looks like. Um, I want to, oh, I just want to see like a full um, picture of what the government is that we're dealing with and how that plays into trauma. When we start talking about trauma, we'll be a little bit more informed about some of those practices and how those go um, and, and kind of tie that all in. So thank you for saying that. We will get there or else I would not be alive and thrive, right? <laughs> Absolutely. We will definitely get there. Be ready though, because I have hard trauma conversations with people. So um, we got to be ready about that. Absolutely. 
Um, Pastor Rick, any? Oh, someone was saying, who was saying that? I didn't yes, it's me, Lauren. Oh, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> hey, Chandra. I just had to put in a little too, just a little bit. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Um, the one thing I was, when we were talking about groups to maybe target is, uh, I was thinking the thing that keeps recurring in my head is uh, the youth. And so I think I mentioned that when we were speaking about, you know, like Rick had said, um, and about, if that's correct, if I said it, Val is what she mentioned too, is um, motivation. So I would think, you know, mainly targeting the youth as, of course, they're the future, but also find, helping them find their motivation on the importance on why voting is important for them and speaking their voice on, you know, the matters that's going on within their county and the country too. So I think that's, um, uh, at least we not forget the youth and, and their ways of making change too and, having, and supporting them. Yeah, we definitely want to get our youth involved. Thank you for that. Um, Pastor Rick, do you want to give us some closing remarks? Um, thank you all again for hanging in there with us. We are at 2.30. I stuck in here for two hours for this conversation for y'all, okay? So <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, that just lets me know that we this, this is important and this is just work that we really have to do. Um, and it's going to take all of us and then some. So when we start sending out these emails for um, next meetings, please feel free to share, recruit, do what you need to do. The more that we have on here, I don't care if we have 500 Wyandotte County members sitting on here and supporters and allies. We need to um, we need to have these conversations. Pastor Rick, you have some? Sure. I just uh, thank you, Chandra. Sorry for messing up your name earlier. Um, <laughs> I, I would just affirm what Andrea said about relationships and how important those are. That's really the starting point for the work that More Squared does is to build relationships one-to-one. -one. Uh, we have a beautiful tapestry in our community, but the ends of the threads are all frayed and not connected, and we need to connect up those threads of the tapestry so that we can be the beloved community that we're called to be. And I would just encourage everybody on this call to find, pick somebody who's on the call that they haven't had a conversation with yet and set up a conversation and uh, do a one-to-one. -one. Talk about what your self-interest is and how you can uh, make that self-interest work with the common interest of the community together. So that would be my closing words was take, take a little step of action and, and create a new relationship today. Awesome. DA, you got to close this out and, you, and we're done. You have any? Ditto, ditto, ditto. I've spoken enough. Be All right. Time. All right, everybody. Thank you so much um, for your time. Again, I can't thank you all enough. This is just, it's encouraging to know that um, we all are, we're not doing the work by ourselves. We all have a support system and it's right here in front of us. Um, so let's continue to connect the dots. <laughs> Y'all like that? One dot? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Let's continue to do this work, and I hope to see you all soon, and uh, I pray you all have a blessed day, okay? Thank you. That was so corny. <laughs> it was corny, <laughs> but you got it, though. We'll, we'll remember it. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye. <laughs>